So next up, I am super excited to welcome Timothy Morton, who is the Rita Shea Guppy Chair in English at Rice University. Um, they've collaborated with uh, artists uh, from all walks of life, from Bjork to Jennifer Walsh to Adam McKay, Jeff Bridges, and Olafur Ellison. Even Pharrell Williams makes that list, which I learned when I was uh, putting this together. <laughs> um, uh, Morton co-wrote and appears in Living in Futures Past, uh, a 2018 film about global warming with, with, with Mr. Bridges, and he's, the op and he's the author of the libretto for the opera Time, Time, Time by Jennifer Walsh. Um, amongst publishing many books that have helped us to think through materiality, object-oriented ontology, um, and new forms of ecological systems that are emerging, um, they also run a blog called The Eco Thought um, that I've been having a really amazing time reading through, and uh, uh, I've been really enjoying that format. Um, in any case, I'm really pleased to introduce uh, Timothy. Very, very sweet introduction. As a, I'm just going to lower the tone now. So sorry about that in advance. All I've got is a sharpie and a sense of the ridiculous. You know, so thank you very much for laughing, by the way. It's very, very important for my ego that you keep on doing that. And th this is so much worse than the selfie. Can we just like remove the selfie thing? Because like that was a magic thing that happened. And you know, magic. Talking of magic, it's like maybe it's just like older science. You know. Like my wish list, one of my wish, things on my wish list is like, we see history as like science, 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 religion, science, 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 science. Like, like. Um, but really I just want to talk about being an idiot for, for a minute, you know, and I, I, I really am an idiot. I'm slightly happy to be one um, sometimes, you know, so, but, but like I didn't even know that, that Distant Early Warning was a Marshall McLuhan thing. I thought it was a rush thing, you know. I thought this is going to be like Geddy Lee and Alex Life. I'm just, I'm so sorry, I'm lowering the tone. But I'm just like a Philistine philosophy guy. And I did this dialogue with Slavoj Žižek a few months ago. And he said something so awesome at the end. He said, for you, I reserve my highest compliment. You are not a complete idiot. And so I said, this is the goal, dude. This is like, I've put tenure, money. No, no, this is what I want in my life. Timothy Morton is not an italics complete. Idiot, and, and I said, can I have this on the back of all my books now in the future? Yes. So now I'm having arguments with the press. It's like this is actually a really cool thing that he said. You know, please can I have it? Like, it's, it's great, right? It's not a complete idiot. Um, I've, I've got five points to make. Um, one of them says, point one a, Germany, nerves. Um, so that's just. So I gave this lecture in sort of on Zoom in Germany earlier. Today and it was I was all nervous, you know, because it was to like a group of scholars and I was trying to sound all clever and stuff and I and, and for some reason those nerves have really carried on, you know. So feeling like an idiot and feeling a bit nervous, um, an emotion. This is the title of the lecture, yeah, or whatever this is, thing, thingy that I'm doing here. An emotion is a, is a, like an idea from the future. Yeah. Um, phenomenologically speaking, if you want to use a posh sounding word for it, yeah. All phenomenology really means is like how something happens tells you what it is, you know? And how an emotion happens is, well sure, an emotion is like a symptom of something that happened to you in the past. In my case, this German thing that just freed me out, you know, that talking of laughing, which we weren't, I was in Munich a few years ago and I said some, something that I thought was funny and they were completely blank. I said, by the way, that was a really funny joke, please laugh, and, they, and, they, and then they did it. Ah! It was so like, Oh no, please don't do that. Um, an emotion is an idea from the future. Yeah, of course it's a symptom of something that happened in the past, but like, why do you do therapy? Because you're having a feeling you don't understand it yet, right? And so this kind of not yet quality is very important. And I want to be very clear about this. Like, the future isn't a dot on a Wikipedia line. You know, it's, a, it's the possibility that things can be different happening right now. And it's actually totally and utterly available in the fact that, you know, data doesn't actually ever, ever, like, capture the thing about which it's the data. You know, data is a Latin word meaning things that have been given. Yeah. You know, like, so I made all these funny choices to wear these funny clothes, and, like, my face is a map of the acne that I had when I was 19 years old, right? So you're looking at the past here in various different ways. 
you know, that this is the, the next point is going to be about being a 50-year-old philosopher. Um, but then on the other hand, who the hell is this Tim Morton guy and what is this talk anyway and what is philosophy and blah, 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 blah. That's the future, right? So kind of everything is that, right? Like, like this microphone, it's like, well, you, you've got the shape and the size and the history and the whatever it is of the microphone. Plus, what is a microphone and what else could we do with it and blah, 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 blah. That's the future, right? Everywhere in life is a kind of crossroads where the past and the future are kind of overlapping without touching. And you know what my real job is, actually? Um, my real actual job is trying to help Generation Z not to feel like they want to die when they get out of bed. You know, and I think people like me have a huge responsibility to actually do that for them because it's like it's our fault. You know, it's our fault. And, and when they say the previous generation screwed it up for us, what they kind of mean is like the previous 12 and a half thousand years of generations screwed it up for, for, for them in the, in the big picture. You know, and then there's the settler colonialism slavery part that America isn't even slightly over yet, you know. And then there's the, you know, very uncomfortable capitalism, steam engine, fossil fuel part of it that's obviously, you know, munching down planet Earth. And obviously capitalism is a kind of algorithm. An algorithm is a recipe. A recipe is based on the past, right? The past is eating the future, literally, right? So how can somebody like me keep the future open, especially for Generation Z, you know, who seem to like to read my stuff, you know? So I feel very responsible, and I, like, I, I try to be, you know, please let us not conjure into existence another Greta Thunberg-like being to outsource that kind of stuff for us. That's kind of, we sh I should be ashamed of that, that people like me conjure that into existence. And the other thing I should be ashamed of is, like, clearly the way people like me are talking isn't helping, yeah? This kind of mostly kind of Eeyore thing that we do, right? Like you look at page one of the newspaper and it's all these very, very, very scary new facts and new data to you. So page one is telling you that you're stupid, right? And then you turn to the middle of the newspaper and somebody, some kind of Eeyore-like being like me, is basically saying, you're a bad person. You're doing this wrong. You're thinking about it wrongly. You're bad, you're evil. Stupid and evil is not a good place from which to launch any kind of progressive politics, right? And, and told you so, is the politics of failure. It also nicely overlaps with evangelical Christianity, right? Like this whole kind of, well, you should have prayed to Jesus more, then this apocalypse wouldn't have happened, right? Um, so, you know, kind of let's, like, how do we not do that to ourselves and, and each other, and especially not to Generation Z? And now that I'm 50 years old, I understand what Aristotle meant when he said that, you know, you start to do nice philosophy when you're that, age because I think it's because when you're younger you sort of think philosophy is about having big ideas you know especially boy philosophers are really into that right and comparing the largeness of their idea to the size of somebody else's idea seems to be the point and then you get to this point where it's like well actually it's maybe it's about trying not to have an idea and if you think about the word philosophy it, it, it's really two emotions right You've got your philos, that's an obvious one because it's love, right? And, and so fear is also an emotion. Yeah, if you had a choice between philosophy as a series of instructions or like little wise sayings on a fortune cookie, you know, or wisdom is a feeling, I think you're going to go with wisdom is a feeling. Yeah. And so, you know, really, truly, philosophy should be about like inviting the future to, to beam into the, into the present moment, right? And it's kind of like... You're driving down the Wisdom Street in the, in the love car, the love mobile. You know, maybe it's a Tesla, I don't know. Um, and um, the lampposts are the ideas, right? And you don't want to point your car at the lamppost because you're going to get wrapped around one, right? The point is the movement, yeah? The point is to keep, keep the movement kind of flowing. Um, talking of which, what have I got to say next? Single cell symbiosis feel. Okay, let's try that. Um, 150, 300, whatever million years later, after the first ever, like whatever that was, popped into a single celled org organism, there's like a conference of plants and animals going, wow, that was so great. That was so great what happened because that evolved into chloroplasts and now we can photosynthesize them with plants. Or that evolved into mitochondria and now we can like do our animal thing, like moving around and stuff because we have oxygen. 
But from the point of view of that single-celled organism, right, that's the future, yeah? Um, and that, there's a kind of uncertainty there, of, of kind of a radical one. Like, imagine if that single-celled org organism could speak, right, and it's kind of plopping through the ocean, and suddenly, boom, fuck, did I just swallow poison? You know, have I just poisoned myself? You, you, you have to have a, a, a permeable cell wall to be a life form, right? So stuff can get inside you, you know, and unless you want to build a wall and interrogate the other to death, you know, to make sure that only the right people come through the wall that's more rigid than anything to do with life and is really to do with the thing called the death drive, if you're into the psychoanalysis side of life, um, then you've got to realize that actually this kind of fundamental uncertainty, kind of paranoia, you know, is part of your empathy structure. You don't have to get rid of it. The point is not to get rid of this uncertainty or the possibility that things could be kind of scary or dangerous or hostile. The point is to sort of in, be inviting to, to other life forms, right? So fundamentally, symbiosis is a, sort of based on a kind of uneasiness, you know? There's a symbiotic relationship between whatever that is in the uterus and the mother's body, right? And they're both trying to get rid of each other. In a way, a birth is an abortion that failed, right? Like, like quite rightly, at some point, the body goes, fuck it, I'm gonna get rid of this, or, or, this, this organism that's like sucking the life out of me, you know? Um, so I think, you know, on the whole, um, we've got everything that we need to invite the future including all of the negative emotions, right? Because in a way, all the negative emotions are why you do therapy, you know? I remember the first time I went into therapy, I was, maybe it was like 25 years ago, um, I paid six figures to have a normal Oedipal dad, you know? And it's like everyone pays for their dad, really, so I guess I paid for that dad twice. And, um, you know, the first therapy, so I, I, I want to chop my dad into little bits, you know, I'm really angry with him. And um, the therapist was like, wow, that's... What have you got against that? I, I was really leveled by that. Like, what, what, oh, you know, because it's like how you are thinking something or how you're doing something kind of is what you're doing, you know? The how is the what, which is just basic science, yeah. But also, um, okay, so point four is, um, so logically let's talk about Satan now. Um, but maybe I should go to point five, which is to do with STEM, you know? Um, humanities, you know, we, we do ourselves a, a disservice in the arts and the humanities by kind of pleading in a scientific game space to be liked by, by the government and, and by ideology, you know. Um, because in fact, what, what those things are about is how to have a fact at all, right? Biology is about how to make facts that are biology true so you can make your interpretation of the data, which is what a fact is in the modern age, and you send it to nature, and the editorial board says, you can publish it even though we don't agree with you because it's logically coherent, right? So you train to make biology facts or astronomy facts or whatever, but STEM is kind of forcing us to miss a whole big spot here, which is like how to have a fact at all, kind of based on almost nothing, you know? Um, the humanities and the arts are the STEM. Right? Like in the Middle Ages, they got it right, they called it the trivium, which is, we, we get the word trivial from that. But the, in the beginning, it means three-legged stool, yeah? And first of all, it's like, how do you work the operating system of meaning? It's called grammar, right? And then, how do you make meanings that are coherent, that don't suck? Um, it's called logic. And then, how do you convey those meanings to yourself and other people in a way that works? That's called rhetoric, right? And then you do astronomy, or then you do theology, because it was considered a science in those days, or natural philosophy or whatever, right? But like, instead of trying to turn kids into like a billions of times slower version of what their iPhone can do already, so that 10 years from now, when they're grown-ups, they can compete with these iPhones that are now trillions of times faster, calculation speed, like what's wrong with this picture? You know, calculation and computation is not the same thing as, as math. Right? Very simple, quick check. It's like how to teach critique of pure reason in five seconds. Show me the number one. Anyone want to try? Where's the number? Oh, good. That's your finger. That's not the number one. That's you. That, so this is Kant's example. 
right? It's like when you try to figure out like what a number is, all you do is you point to things and you hold up fingers and that, that's not a number, you know? He was great at asking stupid questions, right? Like, like, like people who ask stupid questions are great. You know, like Marx, like how come you can make money? You know, you buy a house and it goes up. You think I'm gonna buy a million houses with this, but the other guy's house also went up, so nothing's happened. So how can you make money? Like how does that even work? And then, and then Darwin, like, what, how, how come these finches have got these different shapes of beak on these different islands? It's really like, ugh, you know? Kant, how can you be right? Like, wait a minute, like, no one ever asked this question before. Like, how can you be right about stuff? Um, yeah. Thank you for laughing at this, really. It's, 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 it's all, all I've got. All I've got. You know, like, I, I was in the shop and I bought these trainers. I didn't even know what they were. And the guy was sell, sold me them, and so, like five minutes later, I was giving him $1,000 for these trainers. That's how much of an idiot I am. Because I thought, oh, I really want these shoes that look like socks, you know. And he said, um, you know, what do you do for your job? And I said, well, I teach stuff at university. And he said, do you ever give people Fs? I said, no, I never give people F, actually. I always try to help them revise their work so they get the grade they want at the end. And he fist bumped me. And I thought, wow, I'm nominating you for president of the United States. So let's just f end this by talking about Satan for a minute, and then we can all have lunch. Um, so, you know, God, if they exist, is some kind of master-like being. You know, you can never serve them correctly, which is why you have religion, yeah? Now imagine a servant who does exactly what you tell them to do, right? Exactly what you tell them to do, right? Like every story you've ever heard about Satan Right, or the magic fish. But also the biosphere, you know, the biosphere does exactly what you tell it to do, right? You wash your hands with antibacterial soap, you force the bacteria to evolve, you buy an avocado from Chile, you just wasted a lot of fossil fuels, right? Living in the biosphere essentially is like living inside of Satan's body. And doing things to do with ecology is like making it, and whenever I say Satan, people smile. This is the idea, right? You've got to, say, you've got to talk about Satanism because it makes people smile. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, question. Uh. I got so scared. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tim. Um, you know, something that struck me is obviously you are a teacher, you're a professor, and you know, you're teaching students, and you're talking about these ideas about facts and the truth and our feelings. So how do you navigate knowledge sharing and educating a new generation amidst this mess? Oh, my gosh. Um, seriously, very, I, I pay a lot of attention to it, possibly so much that I can't quite articulate exactly what it is that I do. But for example, so, you know, my daughter, she's just turned 18 and she came in the kitchen a few months ago and she was crying and she'd been looking at Reddit, you know, and she's like, Daddy, we live in hell, you know. And I was like, oh my God, parenting skills, 101. And, ah, quick, quick, quick. And I said, okay, we do. Um, so here's the, you're right. So first of all, you just get, yeah, that worked. Um, but you know, Oliver the cat also, is in hell, right? And the trees outside are in, in, in hell. And the, the, so how do we take care of Oliver? Because Oliver's also in hell. And you can sort of see the tension kind of going down inside her, right? Like Generation Z feel paralyzed, you know? And people like me don't help because our idea of being clever is making you feel par like paralyzed. Like you have no idea how powerful ideology is. You have no idea how screwed everything is. Please give me $5,000 and a nice hotel. And by the way, my books at the back, you're screwed. Like, why is that? Like, how did we argue ourselves into thinking that was like a left-wingy thing to, to, to do to people? Yeah, sure. Since we do um, art stuff here, for some reason. Art stuff. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, we were talking a second ago, you had this little cool book called All, All Art is Ecological, and I know you've written about art and magic and stuff for a long time, and so I just wanted to poke you on like, Oh, for Why real? should we do, you know, like, is so, there any so, thoughts so, on, like, so, how okay, this fits into the picture? It's super, super simple. Art actually is the future. Yeah, art is from the future, right? The future is the possibility that, that things can be different. Not the predictable future, which is just like building a thing out into the abyss, like Wile E. Coyote. Yeah, but the actual real futural future, you know, like, when is this sentence going to end? Balloon, elephant, parenthesis, period, exclamation mark, dot, dot, dot. 
Right, that's, that's basically how I teach deconstruction, now you know. Um, so art is the future, and I'm like the janitor of the, of the future, basically, that's what a philosopher is. Okay. <laughs> See more? Do you have another one you want to? Is this a mic nah. drop? All right, know. yeah, that's it. I'm not, not. there you go. Um, it's lunchtime.